I am thrilled that we were finally able to get um, the Foundation's APS Type 1 APHESED registry launched, and we did so on World, sorry, World Rare Disease Day, which was February 28th of this year. Our goal is to get 100 participants by World Rare Disease Day 2020, and we're well on our way. So we now have 37 people who've logged onto the site and have started the registration process, and we have 20 people that have completed all the surveys from nine different countries around the world, so that's pretty fabulous as a start in just four short months. Um, if any of you are in the group that have started but haven't finished the surveys, come talk to me, because I know it's not as easy as we would like it to be, um, but with a little perseverance and about an hour, maybe an hour and a half of your time, uh, your help putting your data in or your child's data into our registry is going to be fabulous and it's going to really help our group and our community um, bring more attention to the disease and allow more data to get out to the research community. So thank you very much. Oh, one tip, save your data as you go. We've had a couple experiences where people have taken, particularly when you're entering your medications, because we take a lot of them, if you spend too much time entering your data, it will time you out. So time yourself every 10 minutes or so to click the save button so you can save yourself a whole lot of aggravation. Okay, and so uh, I'm just going to uh, remind you all why you might want to join uh, the APS-1 registry. And so the first reason is uh, to identify the timing and frequency of various manifestations of APS-1. The more we know and the more information we have from uh, as many patients as possible, the better we'll be able to uh, tell other patients and their clinicians what to look out for when they're taking care of a patient with APS-1. Uh, the second thing is to determine who's using what treatments and for what indications. Sharing information about the medications you're taking and what works for what is going to help other patients know what treatments might be useful. And then thirdly, our goal is to find every patient with APS-1 around the world and have them in one group where we can find out uh, as much uh, as we can about them and uh, break down barriers for researchers who have interesting and great uh, scientific questions about APS-1, but don't have access to APS-1 patients at their hospital. We want to be able to connect patients with as many researchers who have interesting ideas and time and abilities. Um, so, so far, you know, really the gold standard registry in North America is the NIH registry. So we are sort of benchmarking this online registry to that. Um, and so far, of the 20 patients who have um, answered all questionnaires, over 80 percent have entered, uh, were identified by AIR gene testing, another 11 percent by whole genome sequencing, and the last 5 percent by antibody testing. And when we look at the distribution of reported manifestations, it's quite similar to uh, the um, data that we just actually reviewed from the NIH. The most common manifestations are hypoparathyroidism, ectodermal dysplasia, adrenal insufficiency, and uh, chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis. And then, similarly, as we just heard, we're very interested in uh, nailing down the very first manifestations of disease because uh, diagnostic delay is such a problem for our community. And so uh, in our uh, online registry, patients have reported, again, urticaria, uh, and for us, gastritis, pneumonitis, uh, uh, hypoparathyroidism, and candidiasis are early manifestations of APS-1. So um, we're working to validate and uh, uh, extend uh, the findings of the NIH. Okay. So in conclusion, just want to thank both NORD and the FDA for helping fund uh, the initial launch of our registry. They've been great partners in this. And I also want to point out that the website is not www, it's https colon backslash backslash. Um, that'll take you right to the site. You can link to it also from our website. And as uh, Dana mentioned, you know, the gold standard is Dr. Leonakis' study at NIH, but we would encourage you all to join this registry as well, if for no other reason than not all of us can get to NIH 
maybe ever or as often as we would like. And so this is a way for you to continue to, to input your data and it's data that we as a community own. So we, we can control who gets access to it. Um, so thank you. If you have questions um, or you're having any trouble with it, um, email me at registry at apstype1.org. That comes right to me and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dana and Robin. And uh, I should also add that Dana and Robin have spent countless hours over the last year working to get this registry online. And thank you so much for all of your volunteer time to do this. It was a lot of work, to say the least. And the work is on ongoing. Um, if you would like to sign up for the registry while you are here this weekend, we have com the, the board members, we have computers here. I'm going to look really busy today, but I have lots of time tomorrow. I could sit down with someone and help you get started. Robin can, Sherry and Dave are here, Todd. Todd and Heather are here, so just come to one of us if you need a little help getting started. We're so happy to help you. Um, so thank you very much for that. Our next speaker really needs no introduction, um, but if there's anyone in this room who has not met Dr. Leognakis, then I am going to insist that at the break you come over and meet him, um, because it will, your life will be changed, or your family member's life will be changed. Um, Dr. Mahalis Leonakis serves as the chief of the fungal pathogenesis section at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. His laboratory research aims to define the immunological mechanisms that account for universal susceptibility to chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis in patients with aphid syndrome. Dr. Leonakis will be sharing his talk on new knowledge on managing the APS1 aphid patient. Thank you so much for being here. This is your third time at our symposium. <laughs> Well, uh, thanks so much, and uh, thanks for uh, allowing me to be here three times in a row. Uh, it's, um, it's great to see a full uh, room, and I think uh, it's important to be in a forum uh, where immune dysregulation is discussed in, in a general term, like the IDF, as, uh, as we already heard from Greta, and as I'll illustrate, and we'll hear more. Uh, this is really a disease that uh, spans all of these disciplines, and it's important to recognize because those are the physicians that will really need to be alert to help the patients early on. So uh, it is true, as uh, Jennifer uh, mentioned, that when uh, I started my lab in 2012 and got interested in this disease, uh, we were interested in primarily or initially from the standpoint of why Canada happens and not other infections. I think uh, for those of you who have come out tonight, and as I'll try to illustrate uh, very briefly here, uh, that's really uh, far from the only thing we do. Uh, and uh, our overall goal, as Greg mentioned earlier, is uh, be able to look at the patient as a whole. And being in a place where we can uh, have the luxury to do that, uh, it has been an eye-opening experience for all of us, and I think for many of you. So. Uh, I will use this opportunity, as there's going to be another session about the overview of the natural history study and uh, in dedicated speakers to talk about some of those issues, most to highlight some of the issues that I think are practical. And since this is going to be recorded, and uh, you can go to your clinician and say, you know, I have a link for you, and you can go and answer your questions that I'm sure all of you get uh, uh, to ask your physicians. And you ask us all the time. So I thought that I would use this opportunity to go through what I think are uh, uh, important uh, parts uh, of how we can take better care of the individual patient. Because this is a disease, as with many other diseases that have a single gene defect, that uh, if you take three patients randomly, they will have very, very different diseases. And uh, it's important to be able to recognize all of this to take better care of the patients. So I'm going to uh, steal what uh, Greg did earlier and show a case that wasn't from 1929, but was from uh, our actual experience. Uh, from early enrollment uh, at the time when, as I'll go through the talk today, you'll see how now we know. Uh, but at the time, we didn't. And how we were able to actually to learn through the process of seeing uh, uh, all of you uh, at the NIH. So this is a girl uh, that uh, uh, at the three-month uh, uh, mark had uh, this, uh, uh, what we will start calling apicid rash onwards, as, as you'll see, because I think it's important to 
not call it something that can be confused with another hundred things, but really it's a very characteristic uh, 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 rush that has the potential to really make diagnosis very early, and I'll highlight that as we go. So as many of you uh, had come to us and were telling us about this and we were ignoring it for about a year, a year and a half until it begins like, well, wait a minute, this is too frequent to ignore. Uh, it's truly uh, a very early common manifestation. And this girl, as many uh, uh, of you or, or your uh, family members uh, presented with this without any good reason, and the rush came and left, and then it came back again, and, came, and then it left again uh, without something that you did to make it go away or come. And then after the age of three, that just all of a sudden stopped happening. Uh, three months after that initial rush, uh, 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 the girl developed uh, oral thrush, for which she was getting topical antifungal therapy, never developed other fungal uh, infections. And then at the age of one, uh, she started having uh, multiple lung infections. And I have the infections in quotations because they really were not infections. And uh, we'll hear more about this as we go. A year later, several things happened. Uh, from stomach inflammation to liver inflammation to the enamel uh, problems when uh, the, the girl went to the dentist for the first time and to the uh, uh, nails that we also heard from that 1929 uh, uh, description. Now, first infection was at year one, but uh, it took about five years for somebody to do an X-ray to find what uh, was noted to be bronchiectasis. Now, in simple terms, that means uh, scarring of the lungs, uh, these bronchi that deliver uh, air get a little bit dilated, and that's because you have recurrent infections or recurrent, in this case, bouts of inflammation. And the way you have a scar on your arm, uh, the lung responds with something that's called bronchiectasis. Now, two years before that x-ray was done, uh, there was a hypocalcemic seizure. And despite the fact that that girl had thrush since six months and had a seizure, and somebody measure calcium, because I think many of you know that sometimes that doesn't even happen. Uh, it took about another year to suspect this and eventually get tested later on. Now, at the age of eight, uh, there were several problems with uh, lung infections, uh, fevers and, and sputum production, and there were bacteria that are growing and antibiotics given every few weeks only to last uh, put the patient feeling better for a few days or a few weeks to come back again. Uh, we eventually saw uh, the patient in uh, Hatena AIDS in February 2015, and at the time, uh, she really had progressed to develop uh, uh, symptoms that they were chronic and daily and compromising a nine-year-old from running around, which is a problem. So uh, this is the past medical history of this particular individual. And uh, you, what you will appreciate here is, of course, there are two classic dyad manifestations that happened the first four years, with the caveats that we men mentioned about how these were not necessarily put together as they should. Uh, but also, as you can appreciate, uh, six other manifestations that happened in the interim, in between of those, all lost opportunities to make a diagnosis uh, that, as we'll discuss, not only uh, could have presented some of the, uh, you know, uh, and complications such as hypocalcemic seizures, but also lost opportunities to, uh, to, to treat uh, uh, broadly, as we'll discuss. When we saw the patient uh, had no fevers at NIH, uh, was not having low oxygen, but when you have, uh, we do the classic test of putting patients to do that uh, treadmill exercise, uh, just for the fun of it. But uh, after six minutes, uh, what you can see here, 9,900% becomes 93%. That is not normal for a nine-year-old. It is not normal for, for me, who am far from nine years old anymore. And there were a lot of abnormalities that were listed here, and Elisa is going to go uh, into a little bit more detail. So uh, labs otherwise look okay, including inflammatory markers. And that's a little bit scary because, you know, you, somebody might... Uh, uh, suspect something and order some labs, and those look normal, then you say, well, I mean, that's got to be something not very serious. So again, uh, raising the, the awareness is important because some of these labs, which were done even before the patient came at the NIH, were not too alarming. However, here imaging was not what a nine-year-old imaging should look like. So for those of you who have not come at the NIH and we didn't have that radiography one-on-one -on -one session, uh, oops. What you can see here is uh, bronchiectasis. All of these uh, white marks are not normal. 
We call these ground glass opacities. There are other uh, terms that don't matter. And when you see uh, here, uh, you again see a lot of uh, those white things that don't belong, and you see this airway that is clogged, what is called mucus plugging. So this is a case, I think, that illustrates uh, extremely well uh, what uh, Greg mentioned earlier, and I'm not going to repeat uh, all of the things he said, but I'm going to give a couple of uh, spins to what he said by first uh, reintroducing very briefly uh, what uh, was mentioned. Uh, there is this classic triad, and this is the early European cohort descriptions where I've highlighted in blue uh, the endocrine disease manifestations, which truly do happen. But uh, if you look at this and you are a clinician that hasn't seen any episode patient and you take that review, you will assume that nothing much more happens except for what is listed here. Now, uh, we talked about the pathogenesis, so we can spare the, the, the extra minute. Now, what we started realizing as we were seeing patients who were enrolled in our study in an unbiased manner, meaning we didn't start taking patients who had horrible candida disease or only lung disease. We just took all comers. And that's a major strength in the sense that uh, we don't bias our enrollment. And as a result of that, we can uh, ask the very simple question, uh, which is listed here. Uh, this criteria, which are very, very useful when indeed you can have the full-blown disease later on, how useful are they? when you have a kid that is one or two or three or four years old and you take the kid from physician to physician without the diagnosis being made. And it was, we asked the question, it was, it was striking that uh, as we were seeing patients that didn't appear to be the case. And I must say this is not an APS1 specific problem. All these uncommon diseases that have been described in one way or another and the dramatic variation that we see from patient to patient also following that rule. So what was evident is that it takes about eight years uh, to develop a diagnostic diet, so meaning having two out of these three classic manifestations. But patients don't develop two manifestations these first eight years. They develop many more. And it was very striking to realize that only one out of five patients, so 20% of the patients, will end up developing their first two manifestations from those criteria that are the more known for clinicians to suspect. Uh, and in other words, four out of five patients would keep going to physicians. I, I showed you this case earlier, six were there. In the, the average, uh, the mean was about three. That means patients would go to clinicians with other diseases that were not very well recognized. And as a result of that, there wasn't even going to be a possibility to put the dots together. <coughs> and uh, Greg showed you this slide uh, with the uh, rush. I'm going to show you a few more images because I think this is an important message to really disseminate uh, in, the, in the community. Uh, and I think uh, uh, why IDF, uh, where a lot of allergists and immunologists and dermatologists are here is critical because this manifests in a very, very characteristic manner. This is a rash that we need to call it episode rash. It's not uh, like this or like that. It's a very characteristic rash that has this very, hist very characteristic histological appearance with neutrophils. So when we talk about urticaria or an allergic skin disease, you usually see eosinophils, which we don't see in this disease. There is really very few diseases that can cause this, what we call neutrophilic dermatosis, Stills disease, which is an early form of rheumatoid arthritis, a few other rare disorders that can cause uh, monogenic problems and inflammation in the skin, and apicet. And that needs to go into the differential diagnosis and in the books so that when dermatologists and allergists and pediatricians and immunologists evaluate patients early on, they think about it. And it happens in 70% of the cases, uh, at least in the uh, uh, over 120 patients we've evaluated, which includes patients from uh, around the, the world as well. Now, uh, Greg uh, alluded to this uh, with regards to this first attempt to ask the question, what if we had better criteria? Not better because the first ones are not good. They're good, but they're not good when you see a patient when you're one or two or three years old. So the answer is, I think we can do better. And uh, uh, earlier it was asked whether keratitis is not an early disease. Yes, uh, gastritis can happen early and pneumonitis can happen early, but when you want to develop criteria, you want to have early and common diseases. Otherwise you have 25 things in a list and that's not practical. So the way we chose these three additional uh, manifestations in the skin, the GI tract and the enamel is because not only they happen early, but they come in adequate frequency uh, that can be incorporated in criteria. 
Now, the implications of uh, making a diagnosis early uh, is uh, you don't want your kid to have hypocalcemic seizures. If you can measure calcium three months ago to see that it is dropping and then you implement therapy, same thing for adrenal insufficiency. But uh, there are broader uh, uh, implications to that, uh, as, as I'll mention in just a minute. So I think the key message here is not only that the spectrum is far broader, and uh, we already heard about how uh, over 30 potential disease manifestations have been reported, of which only five, six are endocrine. That is, that there is a, a big variety of, of problems that can happen that we need to be aware as clinicians. That really translates to this uh, middle uh, long sentence that says all of these subspecialties, from dermatologists to allergists to immunologists to dentists to gastroenterologists, hepatologists, ophthalmologists, and pulmonologists, are more likely or as likely to see the kid who has APS1 uh, before an endocrinologist will, or at the same time. And most of those are not in the radar, or they are getting into the radar, but they need to be more in the radar, I think. The implications for management uh, are, are major, and uh, this is the youngest, actually, patient that we've enrolled in our study, 11 months old. Guess what the first manifestation was? Uh, pretty dramatic. Otherwise, the kid, you know, happy, not crying, like, you know, jumping around, not, not itching, not febrile, as I think all of you have experienced. So 11 months old. Now, why is that potentially matter? Uh, so uh, Greg uh, already introduced the possibility of having a disease where you're not reactive, but proactive. And what that does really mean, if uh, we could uh, capture patients that are one or two or three years old before having two or three or four or five or six or more manifestations, is there room to do something to prevent that from happening? And now after uh, seeing patients with APS1 for six years, uh, I am confident that we can. And that can be done two ways, and I've listed them here. I'm going to mostly talk about one because Luis Marquette tomorrow will talk about the other. As was mentioned earlier, if you have an autoimmune disease that is meant to progress and cause more disease, you can uh, address the issue with treatment when the disease happens and it's full-blown. But there's also the concept of introducing immune modulation or immune suppression with drugs that can uh, prevent all of these additional things from happening. And now that we have proof of concept, as you'll hear in the next session, that we can actually treat effectively this disease, uh, it is only reasonable to take it a further step and say, can we prevent the disease from its full-blown manifestations? And uh, Greg actually is taking the lead to this to develop a, a multinational uh, clinical trial at NIH uh, to start prophylactic immunomodulation in very young kids. Through these criteria that we're just discussing here, just to put, uh, you know, sometimes it's always a question okay, you found something, or not me only, as a research community, and is that really directly translatable? We have close to a dozen patients now in this short few years that are in this very early phase where they could potentially be on something and then the disease stops there. So let's say they had enamel hypoplasia in Canada and maybe that's where their problems stop. Thymic transplantation uh, is a very attractive uh, scientific uh, option, uh, option, and as uh, Greg said earlier, I think a, a transplant from a bone marrow standpoint alone is unlikely to really do the trick. Actually, we've seen patients who had transplantation uh, back in the day before the gene was discovered, and that didn't really cure the disease. So uh, I'll leave uh, Luis uh, elaborate a little bit more tomorrow, but I think the key message is uh, by getting into every physician's uh, differential diagnosis, because quite frankly, all of these diseases uh, that, and manifestations that can happen in APS, APS1 span a lot of disciplines, uh, then earlier diagnosis can happen and better uh, life can follow for the patients. Now, a very quick slide on genetics, uh, as this is not really meant to, to be uh, that heavy on research of a talk, uh, but an important one because uh, we've now realized that not all patients who have the classic syndrome uh, have the classic AR mutations. And uh, as a result of that, if they go and do a commercial available test, or if they come at NIH and they have that test at NIH and it doesn't pan out as being, oh, you have two mutations in AR, 
then those patients can also be, not on purpose, but lost on the track of how they can be intervened. And there are several things that uh, could explain this. So, you know, there are some more, you know, technical genetic things that I don't want to get into. Uh, I think we've identified, and we have to conclusively prove it, uh, non-air or non-coding variants that uh, as we grow and we prove, there could be platforms that then they could be tested. But I think about 10 to 15 percent of the patients we've seen have the classical clinical presentation. And even if they had a really good clinician, they said, wait a minute, I think you might have APS1, and did the right thing and tested uh, air sequencing in a, in, a, in a lab, get the result that would say, oh, you know, I was wrong. And it's important to know those things because they actually these patients need the exact same treatment like the other patients. They don't differ. And they could be misled, uh, wrong choice of word, they could be guided through going other routes of looking for, you know, disease that they don't really have. Autoantibodies against interferon omega is a very powerful tool uh, because most of these patients actually have them. That is not a commercially available CLIA certified testing, and I think that's a major way forward, uh, if you want my opinion, as a, as a foundation where, you know, some lab could potentially take that upon because this is almost universally, uh, we do that at NIH and we've had and a lot of patients uh, shipping samples, but uh, I think that uh, can ha happen beyond just uh, one center. And of course, it has uh, implications, as I, as I mentioned, for diagnosis and treatment. So uh, before I start get throwing things, although I have some time, I'll end by uh, providing a few uh, overview slides of how uh, uh, certain components of the, of the syndrome are important to be managed, in my, in my opinion, in our collective uh, experience opinion. And Greg already put this into Canada endocrine and non-endocrine, so I'll, I'll follow that kind of uh, step. And we get a lot of questions about Kanda. So what I thought is I'll provide four or five slides that, again, can be on the web and uh, I think uh, are, are important for all clinicians and, and for patients. So oral and esophageal disease happens much more often than vaginal. I have not been convinced that I've seen a single case of candida in the skin, and those that say that is probably the urticarial eruption or the epicidrasa we talked about. In other diseases that cause candida, that can happen, but. Uh, I've yet to see a convincing case uh, of that. It presents with severe diaper rash, or it can, early on, and in mothers that nurse, they can get mastitis. That's actually a common uh, way that this can present. And the patients, although they get uh, mucosal disease, they're not at risk of getting bloodstream infections and life-threatening candida infections. So that's an important thing to know. Now, it is important to treat this. And I can't say that all uh, uh, physicians that uh, uh, see the patients uh, have that notion. And it's important to treat it for two important reasons. One is if you don't treat uh, esophageal candidiasis for too long, it can cause narrowing of the esophagus that requires dilatation in procedures that are not uh, so user-friendly. And in a small proportion of patients who have chronic uh, candida in their mouth or esophagus without being addressed, it can actually lead to carcinoma. That's, again, not only an APS1 candida problem. It can happen in diseases other than APS1 where candida can infect chronically in those settings. And what we typically see is resistance. So, you know, the, uh, not the proper way of really treating this disease in long term can, man can result into losing the possibility of having drugs that can help. And up to 40, 50 percent of the patients at times can actually uh, have that problem. So the way uh, we think that this should be managed is acute episodes should always come with a culture, and uh, not that, that's not something that happens most of the time, including sending that isolate for susceptibility testing. And you know, for all of you who have emailed us, we always say this. Why? Because different candida strains are made differently, and they have different susceptibilities to different drugs. And, and knowing that early on is important how you're going to devise your therapy. And resistance can happen in something that early on was susceptible if that's not managed properly. So that is important to know. Plus, there are some strains that they wouldn't work with fluconazole, for example, that is a very common drug that you, uh, uh, most of you are familiar with. So uh, when there is a susceptibility to fluconazole, that's what we do. In patients who have new resistance to fluconazole, sometimes posaconazole, which is a newer generation uh, azole, works. In those that they don't have that option at all, uh, parenteral drugs are needed. 
And uh, we always treat patients for a good four weeks. Anything less than that results in frequent relapses the moment you stop it. And that's not, again, an APS1 uh, entity. It's with all of the patients we've seen through the years with chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis. So a good induction for four weeks is critical because it can actually completely reset the clock or it could allow for a delay into relapse. And then decision with regards to after that month, do we, I need to be off antifungals or I need to be on something else, really depends on how frequent a relapse happens. So if you have a patient that took a month and then a year later, or two years later had a problem, then we don't keep them on antifungals. We do that one month treatment every so infrequent. But if somebody stops the therapy and two weeks later they have a problem, then that's a different strategy. And what we favor there is a very, uh, um, it's, it's a drug that's called amphotericin B that is mostly used uh, systemically, but in this case is really compounded to be used uh, by uh, mouth. And uh, many of the patients actually are treated with a cousin drug of that called nystatin for reasons that uh, likely have to do with the compounding itself. Amphotericin appears to work much better than nystatin. And in some cases, when uh, such an example I mentioned earlier, you have somebody you get on therapy for a month, you stop 10 days later, here we go again. Uh, there are a few patients that require very long-term uh, un uninterrupted therapy. So here is the magic uh, recipe of making uh, amphotericin B, and uh, uh, you can take pictures of it, and it can be on the web. Uh, it can be compounded, actually, in almost every CVS pharmacy. And you can start four times a day, and patients typically do very well. After that first month when you kind of uh, uh, kick the fungus butt, if you will, uh, and the burden is low, then that can come in, and you can actually keep it a check. And we've had patients that done very well on that. Uh, it needs to be refrigerated, so it's not the easiest thing to do, but actually we favor that because that doesn't cause resistance. And we can have patients eventually go down to once a day or even off it. Now, there are newer treatments for fungal drugs, and I'm going to be very, very brief on this. This is actually work from our lab. This is a, a drug called VT1598. Uh, this is a, a newer generation uh, azo that has a, an amazing feature of having a very long half-life. That is, it probably will be approved when the studies are done to be given once a week. In patients with chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis, even perhaps once a month. I think you can all appreciate the potential advantage of that as opposed to, you know, where is my pill again? Uh, this is a, dr a great drug because it accumulates into the tissue much more than fluconazole. Here are drug levels in the oral mucosa. It doesn't allow for candida growth when you have a fluconazole susceptible. So this is the amount of fungus left over without treatment a lot. Fluconazole does well. This is completely eliminated and including in cases where fluconazole doesn't work. And the, to illustrate the fact that uh, he has a very long half-life, this actually, after completing therapy, a week later coming on uh, and seeing, what you see here is this level of fluconazole drug is gone, so then you have rebound of the fungus, and in this case, there's absolutely no fungus left. So I think there are newer drugs that I think will be coming up, but the concepts of therapy should be, still be the same because we don't want to keep going, uh, uh, creating resistance uh, in multiple settings. We phenocopied the uh, fungal uh, susceptibility in mice, and you know these are mice that are uh, apicid mice, and they have a lot of fungus in their in their mucosas. And I'm going to skip this uh, slide, but uh, I think from a research standpoint, uh, you all heard about autoantibodies against IL-17 and others. Uh, that's actually not the reason why these patients uh, get the disease. Uh, that's a longer discussion. Uh, but it is uh, uh, important because actually that implicates potential new therapeutics for treating candida beyond uh, antifungals. Now, I have only one slide with regards to endocrine. We'll hear a lot of endocrine talks later, but I think it's absolutely important to try to balance, and you heard us uh, tell you when you come at the NIH, the, the calcium to avoid the deposition of that in the kidneys. That can cause kidney troubles. A lot of patients receive IV infusions, and they need to be is infused slowly because otherwise all this calcium gets dumped into the kidney. And uh, we, as you uh, have seen when you have come uh, to visit us, we use uh, recombinant PTH around the time of procedures when we do EGDs or colonoscopies, and that uh, spares all of the IV calcium uh, that can uh, be bad, and it is absolutely safe, and at some point soon uh, we'll publish this so that it can be available to everybody who does procedures around the globe. Uh, we heard about the bracelets earlier. Uh, we've seen patients who uh, 
think that they need more steroids and hydrocortisone when they have emotional stress in the setting of adrenal insufficiency. That leads to patients being on supratherapeutics uh, uh, doses of hydrocortisone long term that has implications for osteoporosis growth. So I think uh, education on that front is absolutely critical. Surveillance recommendations have been put forth as proposals from us, and I, I have this uh, here, uh, and again, obviously, will be uploaded. Uh, this is just a template of how we think that if you yearly or more often, uh, for some cases, uh, screen, you can actually get ahead of uh, the problems and not uh, uh, behind. So I'm going to end the last uh, five minutes by highlighting a few important concepts when it comes to non-endocrine disease. And all of these are quite new to us as you know, there was not really much guidance in the literature when we started. You'll hear from Elise uh, in the next session, but all patients who have chronic cough, they really require imaging. Yes, asthma can happen in a kid, but in this disease when you have chronic cough, it's more likely to not be asthma, or it is likely that it could not be asthma. And those entities that I have here have been the misdiagnosis in patients who have actually autoimmune lung disease. And early treatment before developing those scarring episodes that I showed you with the other uh, patient earlier on is really what matters because when bronchiectasis happens, especially when it gets severe, some of those things are irreversible. So we'll hear from Elise about this. With regards to liver disease, all patients require uh, liver function test monitoring. Uh, it can actually be most of the time quite insidious and missed because the level of elevation of enzymes is quite modest and it fluctuates. But it can cause fulminant uh, problems and p patients have had liver transplants because of that. And after transplant, nobody thought that they needed to be on immunosuppression again, so then they got hepatitis again. So it's one of those things that it requires uh, awareness and Theo uh, in the next session will tell you all about how you can actually treat it. It's highly and easily treatable. Now, intestinal disease, uh, we'll hear later from Mukil. And this is a, a complicated uh, entity and one that it doesn't have one flavor of a diagnosis. It can be caused by several things. It can be quite severe to the point that some patients cannot eat. They lose weight. But I think we've now developed an algorithm that Mukil will share that can put the um, majority of patients into remission. As we've grown to see over 120 patients, uh, uncommon things don't appear that uncommon when you see five or 10 out of 120. And it's impossible to put these things together when you just see three patients just because of simple math. So these are um, striking images of all of these being in obstruction in the intestine because of this sac that uh, uh, strangled the, the intestines. It was a boy we had from New York, uh, had lost almost 50 pounds. Um, had surgery and now he's uh, back uh, normal and eating without having problems. So this is called abdominal cocoon. Uh, when it comes to the stomach, it's important to realize that this is a common entity. It can cause uh, pernicious anemia and this is really the antibody that helps to diagnose it early uh, in the majority of the cases and that's one of those that is in the diagnostic algorithm. I think an important thing to, to note is when um, gastric uh, mucosa biopsies look like this. That, that looks like an intestine in the stomach. That's called intestinal metaplasia. That confers a higher risk for development of stomach cancer. And we've seen actually a couple of patients uh, who have stomach cancer. And perhaps uh, when uh, that can be picked up early, we do gastric mapping in those cases, or Theo does, not me, uh, looking at all of the areas of the stomach because if you could pick this up early, it's always better than not. A few patients also develop a condition called gastroparesis with intense uh, nausea and vomiting. And through the years, again, seeing a lot of patients, this is an uncommon entity. Now we have uh, the uh, opportunity to treat it. It responds better to mTOR inhibitors than any other immunomodulation. Uh, many patients have uh, dry eyes and dry mouth. And this is a picture on the right of inflammation in the salivary glands. It can respond to immunomodulation that is given for other diseases. Sjogren's syndrome is not an uncommon autoimmune disease in the United States. There are several million. Uh, usually immunomodulation is not given, immunosuppression just for isolated Sjogren's. But we do know that when we treat lung disease or, or liver disease, some patients get better. So uh, coming close to an end here, I think a few items that are important to also note. 
Renal disease is more often caused by the deposition of calcium through the years uh, uh, for treatment of hypoparathyroidism, but it's important to differentiate from inflammation in the kidneys, which can be a rapidly progressing entity that can lead to renal failure, and patients have received kidney transplants because of that. And again, in the absence of, of implementing chronic immunosuppression after that, patients have had to have a second kidney transplant. Uh, we, I think, have a, 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 some idea, despite the fact that we have small pa number of patients, of how to control this, as a thiaprine-based therapy seems to work. And another entity that causes renal disease in this setting is uh, drug toxicity. So the two drugs that I have listed here, although they do appear to work, we don't like them because they cause kidney problems in the long run. Now, we mentioned eye disease. and. I, I, a common uh, issue that we we encounter is that this can be subtle, can cause dry eyes or itching or a slight annoyance when you look at the light, and that all needs to be addressed. Uh, if keratitis happens, you need to be on topical immunosuppression. Uh, cyclosporin or restasis works wonders, and it should be continued even after the patient goes on remission. And a common uh, battle with uh, local ophthalmology sometimes is, oh, you know, you're doing well now. After a month, we stop it, and then it recurs, and it can cause blindness. And it's something that shouldn't happen because it can be treated. My last two uh, entities are, again, things that are not commonly recognized but are actually potentially life-threatening, and things can be done about them. So I'm going to highlight them very briefly. Uh, a spleen is an organ we have uh, in the abdomen, and it's an important one for mounting immune responses against bacteria, especially bacteria that have a capsule, and we call them encapsulated just to make people confused. These are the three major ones. Patients who have uh, no spleen, they're at risk of developing fulminant sepsis from this that can kill them within a few hours and uh, it's important to screen this. It happens actually in childhood, so patients are born with a spleen, spleen, and then eventually there is destruction, presumably from an autoimmune attack. So this is now a, an imaging of a normal looking spleen. And this is one of our patients where the spleen is missing. So doing an ultrasound, which is again in those yearly uh, recommendations, you can pick it up using a CT of the, of the chest that goes on the upper uh, windows also can pick it up. And we do peripheral blood smears, which is another way to also identify this because these little dots that you see here in, in red cells called whole jolly bodies are quite characteristic for that. And you could have those even when the spleen size is still not gone. This doesn't happen, you lose your spleen from Monday to Tuesday. It's a gradual process and starts with lack of those cells. So we, lack of uh, uh, evidence of how jolly. So we always do this. And what the implication of that is the patients need to be on prophylactic antibiotics. They need to be vaccinated. They need to avoid the dog bites because there is this other weird uh, bacterium called there uh, that is present in the mouths of dogs that uh, uh, can also cause fulminant disease. And all patients who have asplenia need to have a pills of levofloxacin so that they, when they get sick uh, and they're not near a hospital, they start treatment. This can, can be cataclysmic. We had a patient actually that almost died at NIH. He came for a routine visit and just happened to be lucky to have this at NIH and not on her way home or at home. And she almost died uh, being at the, uh, in the ICU for four or five days. Uh, she made it and she's fine, but uh, uh, just to point the... So anemia is the last thing I'm talking, talking about. It's quite common. Iron or B12 the deficiency is the more common things for the re require replacement. Now we've come to realize that there is this uncommon entity in about 5% of the patients where the problem is not uh, you have iron or B12, but you don't make red cells in your bone marrow. So this is bone marrow biopsies now, and these are cells in the bone marrow, and these are all uh, myeloid cells. And here, they should be all dark brown, red cells cell precursors, they're all missing. So this is an autoimmune attack to the cells that make the red cells in the, in the bone marrow. And what really this requires um, through work that uh, Monica uh, is driving in the lab is a different type of immunosuppression uh, uh, that I think we will be close to have more concrete data uh, soon. So to finish, I think early diagnosis does matter. It matters for every disease. I think for this disease uh, uh, it matters even more. 
Uh, we heard about prenatal screening. I think you know California has been the the, the state where SCID uh, uh, prenatal screening uh, uh, was implemented successfully. At some point, this should happen for other diseases. Um, could PQ, PKU uh, cards used for autoantibody detection? I think that's something that there is interest in the research community to to figure out. And I mentioned about how this has implications for early initiation of therapy and prophylaxis. You absolutely need to have physicians that talk to each other to take care of the patients. That's difficult these days, I know. But it's important. And I think a proactive targeted screening strategy uh, uh, with diagnostic and treatment algorithms uh, are more important than a reactive uh, strategy. And I think through research uh, of diseases like this, not only we can take care of the patients better and learn a lot, but we can use those examples to learn important things about other more common diseases. And I don't have time to talk to you about this today. <laughs> Uh, you'll hear some about that tomorrow, uh, but uh, I think that's uh, uh, critical. So I'll end with this slide that uh, highlights the registry and also uh, two of our uh, patients you might recognize, and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. So we just have five minutes for questions before we need to break for lunch, so I'm going to keep it very short. But Dr. Leonakis will be back with the next group after lunch, so please feel free then to ask him further questions and hand up your cue cards. Any questions? Luis. Yeah, could you comment a little more on the gastroparesis? Mm -hmm. So uh, with few patients, and with that caveat, it, lo it looks like it's, uh, uh, there is a lymphoplasmacytic inflammation, so there is autoimmune gastritis. Now why there is a subset of those who have autoimmune gastritis that get gastroparesis, we don't know. Uh, their mTOR inhibitors work quite well, so serolimus, everolimus. The, uh, the azathioprine, mycophenolate drugs don't appear to work very well in the gut in general as opposed to the mTOR inhibitors. So whether there is you know, some nerve damage or some other, uh, we, we just do not know yet. But it's a, it's a subset of those who have autoimmune gastritis. So uh, that, that's a great question and I do not have a great answer for it. You know, we've speculated that this is uh, an autoantigen in the skin, the way that you, know, you get attacked in the adrenal glands. And actually, uh, Mark Anderson ha has some uh, data with regards to potential autoantigens in the skin. Uh, we thought whether this is an infection. We haven't proven that and it doesn't appear so. There are other uh, immunodeficiencies that have these kind of rashes, although they don't look like this, and you can find granulomas and rubella or other things. So this is not related to a vaccine. Uh, I, I tend to believe that this is an autoimmune manifestation. And to answer your second question, why it doesn't go forever, uh, you know, there are some patients that have liver or other uh, uh, manifestations that also they have this kind of remitting and uh, relapsing course. So um, whether they, they, start, they get started on hydrocortisone, which might help, whether there are other reasons, whether there are some exposure in life through a virus or some other factor that precipitates it, it's unclear, but that's a good question. One more. Last. Which one, sorry? The splenia. Yeah. yeah. Now, it, uh, it was a surgical splenectomy. Yes. Would, would you still be doing the same precautions that anybody would take? So, you know, the, the studies that they were done in children that have asplenia uh, with regards to prophylactic antibiotics were done in children. And no studies were done in adults, so the adults were grossly discriminated, if you will. So the, the answer is we do not know whether prophylactic antibiotics in adults helps because the studies have not been done. I always recommend patients, regardless of their age, in this particular disease. The girl that I mentioned earlier was in her late 20s, so she's well into her adulthood. Uh, I think there is a risk, 
And uh, uh, although studies have not been done, and certainly studies will not be done in APS-1 with Asplenia, uh, uh, I think that's, uh, that's uh, a strategy that uh, is protective or can be protective. Thank you. Okay. Please join me in thanking Dr. Leonakis. <laughs>